go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 8. And as you turn there, let me pray. Father, we pray that you would teach us through your word, and I pray that uh, you would teach through my words uh, that declare your words accurately. Help me, God, uh, to, to portray your word as it is true. Uh, we pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts and that you would exalt Jesus with the help of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. So has anybody ever experienced a very short period of time that felt like forever? Oh, yeah. Has anybody experienced that? Or have you ever tried to sit in silence for 30 minutes and it just felt like a long time? <laughs> when I went to Word Life Bible Institute, they required that we take a 30-minute quiet time every single morning in the Word of God. And for some of us college students at 7 a.m. in the morning, that felt like a long time. I don't know where Word of Life got the 30-minute mark, but maybe they got it from Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, because we read that when the, when the Lamb opened up the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, some have interpreted this silence literally as about 30 minutes of silence, and others think that it's symbolic of just a very short period of time, because 30 minutes is the very shortest amount of time that you read in Revelation. Let me say, regardless of our opinion of whether or not it is symbolic or literal, it certainly literally is a very short period of time. But the question remains, why is there 30 minutes of silence in heaven when Jesus, as the Lamb of God, opens up this seventh seal? Why? I have three reasons that I think uh, that I think that represent this 30 uh, minutes of silence. First, I think this silence represents represents the composer Lamb of the world's trumpet symphony signaling with his hand silence within this song entitled The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. And I say that because notice that it's the Lamb who controls the silence because he is just about to cue the trumpet horns, right? And he's He's controlling this silence by opening up the seventh seal. When he opens it up, there's silence in heaven because he's the composer of this redemptive orchestra. Right? He's controlling this silent crescendo. And it's a silent crescendo of redemption because perhaps you recall, or perhaps, perhaps you don't if you haven't been here week by week, how in chapter 6, okay, Christ as the Lamb began opening up the seven seals of redemption that will bring final redemption to this broken world and to our broken bodies. Uh, we gather that these seven seals represent the finalization of physical redemption. We are spiritually redeemed as Christians, but we wait for the full physical redemption of our bodies. And I consider this silence like a crescendo because remember that uh, there was a destructive ruckus in chapter 6 when Christ's Lamb opened up seal number six, and there was a boisterous response from the world as they hid themselves from the wrath of the Lamb. That happens in chapter 6, 16. But in chapter 7, the boisterous anger of the world turns into glad, loud rejoicing from every nation and every heavenly creature to God for his salvation. But now, in chapter 8, suddenly, as the Lamb opens up, Seal number seven, it goes from loud volume to sudden silence. Why is that? It's because there's nothing like a crescendo of silence to grab our attention, right? Doesn't silence grab your attention? Exactly. It was about five seconds of silence, not 30 minutes. Can you imagine 30 minutes of silence in heaven? Grabs your attention. Sometimes silence is louder than sound. And especially after you go from a loud sound, like the loud volume of chapter 6 to 7 to chapter 8, you go from loud to soft. This is to grab our attention for what comes next. It creates anticipation. 
Our redemption is drawing near, and Jesus, the Lamb, is commanding our redemption with the hoof of his hand as lamb. Uh, it's like he's, he's, he is commanding silent reverence as we, wait, as we wait for what God will do next. Um, I think, personally, if, if there is one line from Scripture that verse 1 represents, it would be Jesus cueing Psalm 46, verse 10, where God says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. And he will be. And that's what will, will come next in Revelation. And he says, be still. There's silence in heaven. Now, the second reason I believe that this silence represents something, um, something important, what I believe it represents, um, is a break in between birth contractions. I might sound foreign to some of you who haven't been here for our Revelation study, but remember how Jesus compares the end times in Matthew 24, 8 to birth pains, which we, we know happened in intensifying cycles. Revelation is showing us these intensifying cycles like birth contraction. So when the Lamb of God opens up seal number seven, cycle number two of these birth contractions begin as a cycle of seven trumpets are blown, and then seven trumpet judgments come out of this seventh seal that is broken. And so these seven trumpets actually still remain a part of the seventh seal. Um, it's like our second series of birth contractions that wait for the final push of redemption at the end of the world. And then there, there are three birth contraction series in Revelation, the, the, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and then the seven bowls in chapters 15 to 16. And to me, I think that this illustrates how we experience the Braxton Hicks of Revelation types of birth pains. Remember, that's, that means fake contractions. Um, and so ever since Revelation has been written, there's been a lot of debate on whether or not we are in it or not, or some of this has passed, um, or if it's to come. Regardless, okay, there have been these fake birth contractions that are happening in intensity leading up to the events in Revelation. Um, for that reason, the seven trumpets come out of the seventh seal. You know, you would think that the seventh seal would be the end because seven, the number seven, represents completion. But when, when Christ opens up the seventh seal, there's another series of seven trumpets to come. And out of those seven trumpets come seven bowls. So you can see that just when you think it's the end, it's not the end. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. So the message is our world is in long labor. It's in cyclic labor. Like history repeats itself. You see that in Revelation. However, within the opening of the seventh seal, the first thing that happens is silence. All right, so in between going from cycle number one, birth contractions, to the trumpet, birth contra contractions. There's silence, and I liken that to the pause and the period of break in between birth contractions. Any woman who's given birth know what I mean? You have breaks. Praise God, you have breaks in between the pain in order to like give you rest. So I think that's what, that is, what this is. It's a break in between the next series of judgment contractions. Third, I think that Zephaniah 1.7 uh, gives the best explanation of this silence in, in heaven uh, by interpreting scripture with scripture. This is what Zephaniah 1.7 says. Be silent before the Lord God. Be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. You might wonder, what is the day of the Lord? Um, Zephaniah 1 verses 14 to 17 describes this this day of the Lord, what it is. It says, The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. Uh, a day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Listen to verse 16 carefully. A day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. So Zephaniah 1, 7 to 14, or to 17, describes Revelation 8 and these four trumpets that get blown in, in, in this chapter almost exactly. Notice in verse 2, in verse 2 of Revelation 8, what comes immediately after the silence is John seeing seven trumpets given to the seven angels who then blow their trumpet judgments 
upon the world for the remainder of chapters 8 and 9. So these are the trumpets of Zephaniah 116 that describes the day of God's wrath as a day of trumpet blast and battle cry, a day of distress, ruin, devastation, darkness, uh, and, and it's that darkness we see during trumpet blast number 4 and verse 12. And, and then after, in, in Zephaniah, in Zephaniah 1-7, you see silence. After that comes trumpet judgments, or the trumpets. In Revelation 8, you have silence, and after that comes these trumpet blasts. So you can see the correlation. So what I'm insisting is that there is a silence right before God's trumpet battle cry of judgment that comes upon the world for their sin. Notice verse 17 in Zephaniah 1. I will bring distress on mankind because they have sinned against the Lord. And so this silence, as a result of these trumpets being blown in order to signal the day of God's wrath, the end of the world as we know it, is a somber silence. It's a somber silence. Uh, it's not a happy silence. It's a sad silence. So let me ask us this. Will we join heaven with sad silence for what's coming upon our world? I wonder if it would benefit us as Christians sometimes to take 30 minutes to literally meditate on the future doom of our world and break with sadness for those who are going to be participants in it. Heaven is. Will we? Now before these trumpet judgments are blown on the earth in verse 6, there, there are three verses that stand in between the trumpets being given to the angels and then blowing their voice of battle cry, and these are verses of prayer. In verses 2 to 5, we have verses of prayer. Um, perhaps you might imagine verses 3 to 5 like the breath that provides the air for these angels to blow their horns of judgment upon the earth. It's prayer. The prayer is like the breath that provides these angels with the air to blow judgment on the earth. And so this is what verses 3 to 5 say. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So as I mentioned before, I like to think that the prayers of the saints represent the power behind the trumpet blast of judgment that will be blown upon the earth. But, but pick, I want you to picture this scene with me in order to understand the power of prayer. Because that's what this, this scene is illustrating for us. The power of prayer. So picture, an angel comes and stands at the altar with a golden censer, which was a rounded vessel in which incense and burning coals were placed together in a process of temple ritual. And so this angel is given much incense to offer with the prayers of all of the saints on the golden altar before the throne of God. And so this temple ritual represented prayer, with the, the incense and coals being burnt and wafting up to God. You can see an example of this in Luke 1, 9 to 10, how this ritual in the temple represented prayer. Zechariah was chosen to offer incense in the temple, and it said that while he was, everybody outside of the temple was praying during the hour of incense, because the hour of incense is the hour of prayer. So clearly, this golden censer filled with smoke and uh, coals and incense swapping up into heaven is connected to praying. Sym symbolically, there are two reasons I think this is connected to praying. First, like prayer, the smoke goes up and disappears from our earthly realm into the heavenly realm. Much like our prayers. It represents prayer. But two, this represents prayer because our prayers, like the sweet smell of incense, wafts up into God's nostrils. It's an interesting metaphor. It's an analogy. Um, think about it. God smells everything that we pray. Instead of God hearing all of our prayers, which he does, this image is acting like he smells all of our prayers. Why? Why is it using God's nostrils instead of ears for receiving our prayers? Well, personally, I think it's because the olfactory glands that receive smell in being processed actually travel through the memory section of your brain. 
I mentioned that once before. So that's why when you smell certain smells, it often brings you back to a memory like nothing else has the ability to do. And so when God smells our prayers, it, it, it enacts his sovereign, foreknown knowledge of our prayers. And, he, and it, it brings back to memory all that we've prayed, all that every person has prayed from the past until now. And even if it takes until the end of time, this, this picture is showing that God will answer the prayers of his saints, even at the end of time. We just have to wait. Um, now let me point out a few more things in this picture of prayer. Let me point out that the golden censer and golden altar uh, that these prayers are offered on and before could represent how precious our prayers are to the Lord. Our prayers are like gold. Our prayers are precious to the Lord. So don't stop praying. God loves it when you pray. Uh, notice that our prayers are sacrificial, and that's why they're associated with the altar. Isn't prayer sacrificial? It takes time. It takes work. It takes focus. It can drain you at times. It can also be refreshing. Um, but it, 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 it's refreshing like exercise. It does take work. And notice that all of the prayers of the saints are before the throne of God, meaning that God's sovereign rule incorporates his people's requests. You know, God's sovereignty is a mix between his choosing and humanity's actions. So yes, we affect the sovereign will of God. And so pray. Now in verse 5, we see how our prayers affect the earth as the prayers of the saints rise up to God's throne and then they get poured down on the earth through fire. In other words, our prayers have a bouncing effect. Uh, they go up to God and the spiritual law of gravity brings them down again. Just as God wired the universe so that when we jump up into the air, your body will surely come down to the earth again. So God has also wired the, the rules of prayer. When you bounce your prayer up into God's ears, he hears and re he responds by bringing an answer to your prayer back down to the earth. It might take time, right? You might not see it fulfilled, but he always responds to our prayers, especially when we pray something like, God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, which could be um, the many prayers of these things that God is fulfilling. So I kind of answered my next question, which is what kind of prayers affect, affected the earth in a verse 5 kind of way where fiery judgment is cast down onto the earth? You know, what kind of prayers actually have that effect on earth? Well, I think it could be a prayer like Psalm 17, 13 to 14. You'll read these prayers in the Psalms where we read, Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him, deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. Or, or, or this, uh, this judgment could be the response of a prayer like Psalm 139, 19 that we see being fulfilled here. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, O men of blood, depart from me. However, I think the most immediate context is from Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Do you remember Revelation 6, 9 to 11? I believe it's seal number 5 being opened. And when seal number 5 is opened, martyred saints below the altar of, of God cry out, How long before you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So God has the martyred cry of his children in mind when he answers the prayers of, his, of the saints through casting judgment upon the earth. I think that's, that's, those are the prayers that he really hears. For centuries, we've had, we've had Christians who have died and been murdered for their faith. We might not realize it so much in America, but remember, it's happening constantly. Christians are dying every day for their faith. And so, in Revelation, you're going to see a theme. The Lord brings judgment on the world in order to protect his children. Um, he's a family-focused God. He's avenging the blood of his children that have, that have been martyred for centuries. So perhaps that's the prayer he's answering. Now, in verse 5, the angel takes the fire from the altar, he pours it down on the earth, and then thunder, lightning, and an earthquake ensues. Now, Warren Wearsby makes the point that if you compare this verse 5 with Revelation 11.19 and Revelation 16.18, which is written in your notes, then you will see that the thunderings always give warning that the storm is coming. This is 
This is a sign to say the storm is coming. And it don't, indeed, in Revelation, a storm is coming and it's only going to get worse. It is approaching like thunder in the distance. Before long, you not only hear the thunder, but you see the lightning. And you feel the lightning like an earthquake as it approaches. So let me ask you this. Are you ready? Are we ready for this storm that approaches? Because it's a, it's a frightening thing to go through this storm, even in Revelation, because this is God's holy word to us. Well, I think Malachi 4, 1 describes this storm that is coming through this, the, the seven trumpet blasts. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that, that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that, so that it, it will leave them neither root nor branch. It's coming. Now, I love what a man named Torrance says about prayer in light of chapter 8, and he summarizes it so well. He says, what are the real master powers behind the world? And what are the deep, deeper secrets of our destiny? Here is the astonishing power. The prayer of the saints and the fire of God. That means that more potent, more powerful than all the dark and mighty powers let loose in the world, more powerful than anything else, is the power of prayer set ablaze by the fire of God and cast upon the earth. So let me ask you this. Has... Has your spiritual life grown cold? Perhaps you feel apathetic and you feel like you need, you need fire in your relationship between you and the Lord. Then set your relationship with place through prayer. Prayer is a, a mighty kindling for creating an awesome, passionate relationship with the Lord and for our world, a love for our world. Now, in, in 8.6, these trumpet judgments begin. And they begin as a result, in part, of the prayer of the saints. So a mix of sovereignty, the sovereign will of God, and the prayers of people. Now, as we go through these, these trumpet judgments, it's really important that we connect all of them to the great exodus in the book of Exodus, where God redeemed his people from Egyptian slavery. We should be familiar with that. If you're not, you should read through it in Exodus 7 to 14, okay? And so we're going to continue to see this redemptive motif running through these seven trumpet judgments because Jesus, as the Passover lamb, is opening up this seal, the lamb that was slain back in chapter 5, and he's filling, fulfilling the same, uh, the same purpose that he fulfilled in Exodus 7 to 14, which is physical redemption, saving his people from slavery and judging the world. So you'll be able to compare a lot of these judgments to, to, to this, the ten plagues cast on Egypt in order to release people from slavery. And it's really important for us to know because God's judgment on Egypt were on Egypt, not on his people. And the same is true of these judgments. They come upon the world, not God's people. Granted that we have the blood of the Passover lamb smeared over the doorposts of our heart, just like those who were not recipients of God's judgments in Egypt were his people, and the ones who obeyed the command to kill a lamb, smear its blood over their, their doorposts, so that they would be saved. Now remember that Christ the Lamb is opening up these trumpet judgments, and so as he does, he's protecting his children from these judgments and their own the enemies. And so, as we go through these seven trumpet judgments, you got to be sure you know Whose side are you on? Are you on God's side? Or are you not on God's side? It's really important to make sure you don't have one fit foot in this world and the other foot trying to act like you have a relationship with God. Because if, if you're on the line, you don't know if you'll go through these judgments. And neither will anybody else. You, we need to be sure that we are part of God's church. We are his children. And that he's protecting us, not judging us, because our judgment falls on Jesus, right? The, the lamb who was slain for us. So let me give you uh, an example of how the Exodus connects to trumpet number one. Trumpet number one in verse seven corresponds to plague number seven on Egypt. In Exodus 9, 22 to 30, 35, where hail and fire are poured out of heaven, which we see happening during trumpet number one. I'm describing this in order to show you and prove to you that we are not recipients as God's church. 
of these judgments. Um, because when you look at verse 26 in Exodus 9 and the plague of hail, you'll see something very interesting. It's very important. Verse 26 in Exodus 9 says, Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. And that is exactly what is depicted here in the judgment number one. We are protected because our judgment is on Christ. So, in verse 7, this describes the first trumpet judgment and the judgment is on earth. So here's a description of it. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all of the grass was burned up. God asked the question, is this figurative or is this literal? That is one of the greatest questions throughout all of Revelation because many scholars disagree. Personally, I think this is literal language. This is literal language. So that the hail and the fire mixed with blood means what it means. It's just as literal as the Exodus account where hail and fire fell from the sky upon the land of Egypt, but now it's in a larger proportion. It's one third of the earth. Malachi 7.15 describes how the signs of the Exodus will reoccur during end times, like here. It says, As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. Here it is. The marvelous things of Egypt happening again. Trumpet, uh, trumpet number one also parallels Joel 2.30. Listen to what Joel says through, through the Lord. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. And look at that word blood. It's one of the most un more unbelievable words that trumpet number one catches people off guard with. Um, and yet I read a story this past week that actually talked about a phenomenon in August of 1819 where a man named Captain Ross saw the mountains at Baffin's Bay covered for eight miles with bled red, bled, blood red snow. <laughs> blood red snow. That's a mixing of words, isn't it? And so, I say that to say, perhaps this has happened in the past, perhaps not. Um, history, though, is not a reason to believe in God's Word. God's Word is the reason to believe in God's Word, okay? Uh, and so, the reason we believe this is because that God is the God of the supernatural, right? Um, I mean, how can the blood of Christ in a mortal body take away the sins of the whole world? God is a miracle-working God. Um, and so perhaps God is mixing this plague with blood so that the world could realize this is God and not cosmic luck. You know, this is intelligent design. This is intelligent judgment, not cosmic luck, like often people think. This is not just weather or Mother Nature. This is our Father God bringing judgment on the earth. Only God can do this and mix hail with blood. So the result is the third of the earth with its green trees and grass is burned. And a third would mean a significant amount, amount, but not the majority. It's still not the majority. I think it's a literal one third, but there is meaning behind it. It means there's still room for the world to get worse. Uh, these drum and these trumpet judgments are warning the world that the world, the world that the world will get worse. It's warning us too that the world will get worse. In fact, it already has in Revelation. Remember in Revelation 6, 8, during the opening up of the fourth seal, one-fourth of the earth is killed. Now it's one-third. Uh, and when the seven bold judgments hit in Revelation 15 to 16, you're going to see there's no proportion or fraction spared except 100%. And so it's getting worse. Remember that birth pains, as, they are, as these are, grow more and more intense. And when, when they do... Remember that our redemption is drawing near because these eschatological birth pains are intensifying. Now the second trumpet is blown in verses 8 to 9, which, which describes judgment on the sea. And this is what it says. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Some think this could describe a volcano erupting and turning the sea blood-like. And apparently in AD 79, shortly after Revelation was written, uh, the volcano Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed multiple Roman cities like Pompeii. Maybe you're 
familiar with that story of that city. Some think that this is in view here. Uh, the preterist view of Revelation leaves probably in this view. Uh, but personally, I think that this is describing some kind of meteor falling from the sky and turning one, of, one third of the sea to blood with obvious ramifications like sea creatures dying and ships being destroyed. And I believe this on the grounds of Scripture. Because Zephaniah 1 3 and Isaiah 2 16 describe the same details of trumpet judgment number two in this way. Listen, Zephaniah 1 3 says, I will sweep away man and beast, I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. The fish of the sea, like trumpet blast number two. And the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And Isaiah 2 12 to 16 says, for the Lord of hosts has a day against all, uh, all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. And then verse 16 says, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft. Okay, so, this isn't surprising God, right? This has been planned by God in, in his sovereign will forever. And certainly this day has come in Revelation 8. However, I think the most important detail of, of trumpet number two is how this corresponds to plague number one in the great Exodus story where water is turned into blood. You can see that in Exodus 7, verse 17 to 19. And so again, you see how God is bringing judgment on the world in order to deliver his people out of slavery and oppression. That's the point here. So how should the Christian respond to trumpet judgment number two? It's pretty scary, isn't it? I think Psalm 46.2 tells us, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. All right, so we need not to be afraid of the world getting rocked physically because we are grounded on Jesus Christ, our rock, spiritually. And Christ the Lamb is the one opening up these judgments on the world, these world, the world, not his people. And so, if these types of cataclysmic events happen around us, even in minor ways like tsunamis today, remember that we have Christ as our refuge. We don't need to be afraid of worldwide disaster. I like to look at it this way: it's Christ's blood that shelters us from the sea turning into blood. Remember at the end of chapter seven, it says that God's presence will shelter us. And so we need not to be afraid. We will not fear, though the earth gives way, that the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Now, the, the third trumpet blows in verses 10 to 11. And this is describing judgment on the fresh water. Ju uh, trumpet number two was on the sea. Now we move on to the fresh water. It's, by the way, you can see that these cycles of birth pains and trumpet blasts are getting worse. So, here's the description in verses 10 to 11. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the waters, and, a, and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Now, uh, one man said about the details of trumpet number three, that remember, John is writing pictures, not scientific prose. And although that, though that might be true, he's writing pictures, I think it's also true that these pictures point to scientific realities. So it does seem like an asteroid is coming upon the Earth, falling and polluting a third of our fresh waters in the world. And the, the star is named Wormwood, star being probably an asteroid. And Wormwood is a name for a bitter, poisonous desert plant. So it's poisoning the waters. And the result is a third of uh, our world's fresh waters become undrinkable, uh, undrinkable. Now, it's very interesting that as I studied this, I found that currently one-third of our world's population does not have access to clean drinking waters. So I thought that was an interesting correlating statistic. But here, during the trumpet blast number three, Okay, it's getting worse. So if today one third of people don't have access to clean drinking water, add another one third to that. Right? It's, it's getting worse. Now Exodus 15, 23 to 25, provides us encouragement, encouragement as Christians. If you're a Christian during this, this judgment, this bitter judgment number three. 
Um, it, it provides a contrast for us as Christians against the judgment of these, these waters of worry with. In Exodus 15, verses 23 to 25, the people of Israel are coming out of Egypt, so they've been redeemed, and they come to the undrinkable, bitter waters at Marah. And so God tells Moses to throw a tree, a tree log, into the waters of Marah, and the waters become sweet, and they drink. And clearly, it represents how the cross of Christ turns our bitter judgment into sweet mercy. So it's a good time to remember that trumpet number three doesn't blast into your life if you've participated in the bitter judgment of the cross in which Jesus Christ was crucified for us. The cross of Christ right, was, was God's bitter judgment for us on him so that while judgment was bitter on him, mercy can be sweet to us. <laughs> But trumpet number three is coming upon those who have rejected Christ's bitter judgment on himself for the world. And honestly, they would rather just take it themselves as opposed to standing in the presence of Christ because they hate Christ. But for us, don't, don't forget, this is sweet mercy exercised during these judgments. Just like the asteroid falling from the sky and turning the waters bitter, we have the cross of Christ falling into our life that has made his mercy is so sweet to us. Now, uh, the fourth trumpet comes along in verse 12, and it describes judgment on the atmosphere. Here's the description. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Again, notice that these trumpet judgments are getting worse. Just like today, our world is getting worse. Um, now, again, there's debate on whether this is uh, literal or figurative here. You know, how can a third of the sun uh, be darkened or a third of the stars? Um, and my answer is the same way that God made the sun stand, stand still in Joshua 10, 12 to 13. I have no clue. God did it. It was a miracle. There's no scientific uh, answer for this. In, in Isaiah 13, 9 to 13, it says about this fourth trumpet, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with the wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold in mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will sh be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. I think Joel 3, um, uh, Joel 3, uh, 4 to 16 says a similar, or 14 to 16 says a similar thing. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So again, remember that these judgments are on the world and not on God's people. They are on those of, of Revelation 6, 15 who hide themselves from the Lamb, from the wrath of the Lamb, instead of running into Him for shelter. But we as Christians are exempt from this because we are friends of the Lamb who was slain for us. And our judgment is on Him, not on us, because we've hid, hidden ourselves in the refuge of Jesus against the judgment of God. Because only He can be judged for us and, and so that we can live to tell about it. And again, this should remind us of another plague in Egypt. This should remind us of the ninth plague in Egypt uh, in order to redeem God's people from slavery. In Exodus uh, 10, 22 to 23, it speaks of darkness over the entire land of Egypt, like trumpet blast number four. But it says something very, very important in verse 23. It says, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. Again, 
can't say this enough. It's a good time to remember that these judgments come against those who have refused the gracious judgment of God. We all must be judged. The judgment is either on Christ or on us. Christ came to be condemned for us. If he's not condemned for us, then we're condemned in and of ourselves. So, Christians are not recipients of these judgments because our judgment was settled on the cross of Christ. While the world is dark with gloom, our Christian lives should be bright with hope. That should be the contrast here. Now, in verse 13, we see a transition. Verse 13 says, John says, Then I looked and I heard an angel crying with a loud voice as it flew directly over, overhead. Whoa, whoa, whoa to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets with the three angels that are about to blow. And so when you hear whoa, 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 think of the times you've said whoa. That's bad. Whoa. That's really bad. Seriously, what we say. And these three next trumpet blasts should have that kind of effect. It was whoa. The world is getting really bad. And that should be really our, our reaction to the world around us today. Whoa. This world is really going downhill fast. And yes, because people are sinning, but the Lord is also, in part, beginning the judgment cycle. So the world is getting worse, and the reason why is because of what 2 Timothy 3.13 says. It says, evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So as the world becomes more wicked, God's judgment on earth will grow in proportion to that wickedness. And that's what we see happening in verse 13, and we'll see happening for the rest of Revelation. Um, so again, let me just uh, give an application point. Don't live for this world. Because it's not looking very good. Don't live for this world. Live for Christ. Well, let me wrap up chapter 8 with the question of what does God's heart look like through this? I know some of you don't like the violence. Some of you don't like what you see here. And we shouldn't like it. But this is God's word. So what is God's heart in this? I want to quote my grandfather who writes about how we can hear God's heart through his words in scripture. And in one of his messages, he starts out with 1 Kings 3, 24 to 25, where King Solomon is trying to figure out which mom really belongs to uh, this baby that both are claiming to be their own. Because one of the mothers uh, had her baby die and is claiming, no, this is my baby, no, this is my baby. So King Solomon is trying to figure out who, whose baby really is this. And so in 1 Kings 3, 24 to 25, Solomon says, the one says, this is my son who is living, and your son is the dead one. And the other says, no, for your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. So Solomon said, bring a sword and a baby. All right, he threatens to cut the baby in half. And then my, my grandfather says this, that's what his lips said, kill the baby. But his heart was saying, save the baby. When we read the Bible, it's not only what, what Jesus says, but it's his heart. All I'm saying is that when we study the Bible, put your ear to God's heart and not his lips. We need to hear God's heart. So what is God's heart amidst the destruction of chapter 8 in Revelation and the rest? Let me give you a few ideas for what, what I think he's saying. It's like God is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm destroying the earth and its people so that I can save my children. It's also like God is, God is saying, I'm, re I'm renovating the earth so that I can prepare for reconstruction. He is preparing us for a new heavens and a new earth. And it's like he's saying, hey, I came the first time not to judge the earth, but to save it. Um, you know, in John 3, 16 to 17, a verse that we're very familiar with, you know, Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him will not perish, not perish, but have everlasting life. But the next verse, verse 17, is very important. We often skip over it. Jesus then continues to say, I came not to condemn the world, but to save it. That's Jesus Christ's purpose. Romans 8, 1 says, For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. And that's why Jesus, as the lamb that was slain in chapter 5, is opening up these seals and these judgments, because he was slaughtered with our condemnation so that we can be justified. And that's what he wants. However, there is coming a day when the lamb will judge the world who has rejected his judgment for their sins. 
That day is coming. We can't ignore that day. And I just can't help but think it hurt Christ the first time when he was judged for the whole world. It cost him his life. And it's going to hurt Christ the second time when he judges the earth. <clears throat> it's not as if Jesus loves destroying his creation any more than God the Father loved seeing his son crucified. But he's just God. So here, here's the truth of the matter. Before Christ, the Lamb began throwing hailstones of fire, blood, and bitterness upon the world and its waters. The world and its people had already pierced God with blood streaming from his veins. I think that these judgments represent God's heart like the worldwide flood judgment in Genesis 6, 5-7, to which says this, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Did you hear that? And it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. It's what we have happened here in Revelation. But instead of using water, God uses fire. The world is wicked. It's very wicked. God sees it, and he's grieved to his heart that he's got to make it come to an end. He's grieved. Ezekiel 33.11 says this. God says, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Alright, so notice God does not rejoice in the death of the wicked. He's grieved, just as we should be grieved in reading chapter 8. God is grieved over these seven trumpet judgments, so should we be. So whatever note these trumpets make, it's a minor tone. It's a sad key. So what God is looking for in these trumpet judgments is that the wicked turn from their wicked ways. The word turn is used three times in Ezekiel 33.11, and it's the word for repent. And looking ahead at the sixth trumpet judgment in chapter 9, verse 20, it says that the rest of mankind that did not die through these judgments did not repent. They did not turn back, and yet that was God's purpose the whole time. Turn back to me because I love you. So in other words, the only reason that God is pouring out judgment on the world is so that they can repent. It's purposeful. Okay, This is not mean judgment. God's wrath is not mean, neither is his judgment mean. God's wrath is just and it's patient, it's kind, and it's loving. God has done everything he can do in order to save people from chapter 8 of Revelation by bringing every judgment on his son. And that's why we don't see these trumpet judgments happening yet today, because God's still waiting for more to repent and turn to Christ for their, for, for, for their judgment of themselves. And so, let's end with four questions. Remember how we started with silence over chapter 8, and it was, it was 30 minutes of silence, which should, should bring us to a point of meditation. All right, so I want, to, I want us to be silent a bit and think about these four questions after reading through chapter 8. First, are you a part of God's side or the other side? Are you a part of those who will, who will undergo judgment on this world, or, 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 or are you a part of the merciful children of God? Do you need to repent and turn to Jesus? Do you need to hide in the refuge of Jesus from the wrath to come? You know, in Genesis 6, when God destroyed the earth with water and the wicked perished, it says in Genesis 6, 8 that Noah found favor in God's sight. He was the only one saved with his family. So how is Noah different from the rest of mankind that deserved to be swept away with judgment? He had faith. He had faith in God's word that said, a flood is coming that will destroy the earth. And he believed God. And he proved his belief by building an ark that is a shelter from the rushing wrath of the waters. Well, in Revelation 8, believe God's word, he will destroy the world with fire, as 2 Peter 3, 7 says, except for those who turn from their wicked ways and believe in God's word by running to Jesus as their ark of refuge against the wrath of God. You need to make sure that you have run to Jesus as your refuge. Now, second, if you're a Christian... Are you living a godly life in light of the end of the world coming? 2 Peter 3.11 says, 
since all these things are thus to be dissolved, that is the earth, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? So in other words, because the world is fading in all of the pursuits, don't live for this world. Be godly and live for the next. We need a chapter like Revelation 8 to shape that reality into us. Third, are you grateful? If you're a Christian, you can say like 2 Peter 3, 12 to 13, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So Christian, are you thankful that this world will get heated up in order to get melted down, in order to be welded together into a new home for you? Are you thankful that destruction means preparing a new home for you? It means hope. It means final redemption. Are you thankful? Finally, we need to pause and experience the silence of verse 1 and ask ourselves, ask yourself, do you have a heart for this world that is perishing and destined for destruction? God does. Do you? Remember, he doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. God does not delight in the destruction of chapter 8. It grieves God's heart to destroy a world and the people that he made Revelation is a book that should stir our heart up for the lost, our children, our neighbors, our relatives, our town, our nation. This is the destiny of those, perhaps in their lifetime, but especially in eternity if they don't turn to Christ. You know, Jesus is coming back for us, which is a great thing. But what's great for us is bad for the world. So in Revelation, these woes at the end of chapter 8 should cause us to stop, stop and say, whoa, it's going to get worse in the world. Woe is them who don't know Christ, and woe is me on their behalf. As I read through Revelation all week, I just couldn't help think, this is the lot for the world. Don't we love the world like Jesus loves the world? Let's pray. Let's share the gospel. Let's give them this hope that they don't need to experience this because Jesus Christ took our trumpet judgments, blasted into his life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us so well and releasing us from your judgments on the earth. We thank you that you shelter us with your presence and that you brought your judgment on Jesus for us. But we pray for our passing fading world around us, that you would save them. We pray that you would save our town. We pray that you would you would rejoice over one sinner who repents. We know that's what you rejoice over. We pray that there would be a party in heaven over lost sinners who come back to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.